Uh, hello, everyone. This is Professor David Eagleman. Uh, you might have heard of him before. You probably heard of him before. Uh, excellent neuroscientist. I'm particularly interested in all of his work in what I might call sensory replacement or prosthetics um, of various kinds. And uh, David has also been very active in educating people about the brain. So for example, you may have seen him on a PBS uh, show, The Brain with David Eagleman, that was really famous. Uh, and he's also an excellent speaker, although, you know, sometimes he'll prepare last minute for something like this. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, uh, I don't mean to, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, sorry, I make fun of him a little bit just because we've, we've bumped into each other plenty of times to be able to do that. Uh, he's also been a, an advisor on Colonel uh, when we started that company down in LA. So I've known him from that as well. Um, David, please take it away and show us what you've got. Okay, terrific. Um, okay, I need to share my screen and tell me, um, uh, sorry, give me one second. I, <clears throat> hold on, why is this not, um, D -d -d. Sorry, give me one second. I'm not able to share the screen appropriately. Does, uh, does David need host uh, uh, capabilities? Yeah. I'll give that to him. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I made him. Oh, okay, got it. Yep. Oh, okay, okay, yep. I totally got it. Tell me if you guys see this full screen here. Tell me if you see the full yes. thing and Let's spin it ahead. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. Good. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys this. By, by the way, let me say something, which is I want this to be totally informal, which is to say, please interrupt. Uh, it's probably going to be easier if you interrupt verbally, in, but send chats also. I should be able to see the chats as well. But let's just make this like a conversation. Cool. Okay, great. So um, I'm assuming everybody here knows the, uh, you know, the complexity and the size of, the, uh, of what we have found under the hood. Um, and, um, my interest has always been in how brains perceive reality, like how we understand the world around us. And so, um, the thing that I've been talking about for a number of years now is that we, you know, we're not particularly good at seeing reality at very small scales, and we're not particularly good at, at understanding reality at very large scales because we haven't evolved there. Instead, we've evolved in this middle strip at the size of, you know, mates and rivers and apples and rabbits and whatever, like that's what we're meant to, to perceive. And so that's what we are, you know, that's what we have developed to be good at perceiving. But the, the surprise uh, of interest to me is that we're actually not that good, even at that level of seeing what's going on around us. So an example that I like is, um, you know, electromagnetic radiation, light bounces off objects, hits us in specialized receptors in the back of our eyes. And we say, oh, I'm seeing all the colors of the world. But as some of you presumably know, the you know, visible light is less than a 10 trillionth of the spectrum of light out there. And we have things like radio waves and microwaves and X-rays and gamma rays all passing through our bodies. And it's totally invisible to us. We just don't see that at all um, because we haven't evolved specialized receptors for that. So you have, for example, you know, thousands of cell phone conversations passing through you right now. And it's totally invisible to you because you don't have the right receptors. Now, the interesting part is it's not that this is inherently invisible. Um, you know, uh, rattlesnakes and honeybees will see, um, you know, they, they will see. By the way, Allison, I think there's other people in the waiting room. Just uh, I don't know if you have a check. Okay. So, yeah, you know, other animals can see uh, things that we can't see, like infrared and ultraviolet, just that you can't see that. Okay. So what this leads to is this, I think, counterintuitive idea that your perception of reality is actually constrained by your biology. And, um, and this goes against the common sense notion that you just, you know, you open your eyes and you're seeing the world out there, um, that your eyes and ears and so on are just picking up on reality. So, um, of interest is the fact that all animals pick up on their own signals and get their own reality. So in the blind and deaf world of the tick, it's picking up on temperature and butyric acid. And in the um, world of the black ghost knifefish, it's picking up on perturbations in electrical fields. 
And for the echolocating bat, what it's picking up on is um, sound compression waves that, you know, uh, air compression waves that are returning to it for echolocation. So these are the signals that they pick up on and how they construct their world. And, um, and that's their reality. And these things might not overlap at all. And we have a word for this in science, which called the, the umwelt, which is the part of the world that you can see. And so a consciousness razor that I like to do on this is, you know, just imagine that you are a bloodhound dog and um, you've got this very long snout with 200 million scent receptors in it. And you've got wet nostrils that attract and trap scent molecules. And you've got, you know, floppy ears that kick up scent molecules. You've even got slits in your nostrils to pull in big nosefuls of air. So your whole world's about smell. And so one day you stop in your tracks and you look at your human master and you think, God, what is it like to have the pitiful little nose of a human? Like, how could you not know what's going on around you in the olfactory world? How could you not know that there was somebody here six hours ago or that your friend is over there in the bushes over there, right? So it's, it's hard to imagine what it's like to not know the things that, that the dog knows if you're the dog. But the point is we're all stuck in our umwelt. And so whatever we have, whatever signals we have, we just accept that to be reality. So my interest is in understanding how um, we can use technology to expand the umwelt of being of a human by feeding in new kinds of signals. So you're probably aware that, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of people walking around with artificial hearing and artificial vision. And the way this works is you take a digital microphone and you slip an electrode strip into the uh, inner ear, or you take a digital camera and you plug an electrode grid into the eye and people can come to hear or see with these technologies. But the interesting part is that um, as recently as 25 years ago, there were many scientists who thought this was never going to work. And the reason they thought that is because these devices speak the language of Silicon Valley, and that's slightly different than the natural biological sense organs that you have. You know, normally what's going on with your inner ear or photons in your eyes, it's a little bit different. Um, and so people thought this won't ever work, but it turns out it worked fine. And the way we understand that is, is with brain, um, you know, the, the issue is your reality is only ever constructed out of signals. And when you look inside the brain, you just have these electrochemical signals running over these billions of neurons and trillions of synapses. And um, that's all the brain ever has. It doesn't know, you know, what the signals mean or where they come from, but what brains are really good at doing is extracting patterns and uh, eventually assigning meaning to these signals. And so um, the point I wanna make here is that your brain doesn't know and doesn't care actually where the signals come from because all you have are these different devices for capturing photons or air compression waves or you know um, pressure and temperature and so on and uh, or mixtures of molecules and all this stuff just comes in along these different cables and um, it's exactly the same kind of signal in your brain and so um, and so I think this makes it a very special kind of all-purpose compute device, which is to say your brain doesn't know where, you know, what the peripheral devices are and what the signals are. It just says, okay, I've got information here. I'm going to figure out how to best use it. And so this is what led to uh, what I call the pH model of evolution, which stands for potato head. And the idea is that, you know, all these receptors that we know and love are just plug and play devices. You stick them in and you're good to go whether that's capturing photons or air compression or whatever, it's just your brain figures out what to do with it. And our best proof of principle for that um, comes from a couple of things. One is looking across the animal kingdom and seeing all the different kinds of peripheral devices that you can have. So in snakes, you have heat pits. That's what picks up on the infrared. The black ghost knife fish has electroreceptors all up and down its body. The star-nosed mole has, for example, this you know, uh, nose with 22 fingers where it can feel around in the dark and construct a three-dimensional model of its tunnels and so on. Um, birds, cows, insects can all pick up on the magnetic field of the earth and orient that way. They've got magnetoreception. So what, what this tells us is Mother Nature doesn't have to reinvent the principles of brain operation each time she's doing something like this. 
Once the principles of brain operation are established, all she needs to do is mess around with peripheral devices to pass in other kinds of information and the brain easily figures it out. So the lesson that surfaces here is that there's nothing particularly fundamental about what we've come to the table with. It's just what we've inherited from the long road of evolution, but it's not what we have to stick with. Um, and our best proof of principle for that comes from uh, sensory substitution. And what this is, is feeding information into the brain via unusual um, pathways. And so the first example of this was in the journal Nature in 1969. A scientist named Paul Bakirita put blind people into a modified dental chair where he had a solenoid grid that poked in their back. And he would set up a video camera, put something in front of the camera, whatever the camera saw, you would feel that poked into your back physically so that you could say, oh, that's, you know, I'm feeling this in my back. And blind people got very good at this. I mean, you say, okay, that's a cup, that's a telephone, that's a person's face, that's whatever. Um, and they were able to understand what was happening in the visual world based on touch and the small of their back, which is pretty stunning. And there have been many, many examples of this since that time. So for example, um, with the sonic glasses, it's the same idea for blind people. You have a video feed, but you convert the video feed to an auditory signal. So you're hearing, you know, when you put something in front of the glass, you and you hear this weird cacophony of sound. And um, blind people can get very good at doing this sort of, uh, sort of translation so that after a few weeks, they're listening to the sound and they can understand what is happening in the visual world. And there are many examples, as I can tell you guys, some, some examples of things you can um, download on your phone and so on. There's a group in Japan who did this with an electrotactile grid on the forehead, um, where whatever the camera is seeing, you're just feeling that in your forehead. Why the forehead? is because you're not using it for anything else. Um, the most uh, sophisticated incarnation of this is called the brain port. It's a uh, it's an electrotactile grid that sits on the tongue, which has very good conductance and high resolution. So whatever the camera is seeing, you feel that on your tongue. It feels like pop rocks in your mouth. And the point is that blind people can get so good at this that they can do things like take. Um, you know, you know, take a ball and throw it to a basket at a distance or navigate a complex obstacle course, um, things like this. Now, if this sounds crazy that you can ever come to see through your tongue, remember that that's all vision ever is. You just, you know, you've got these spheres in your skull that are picking up on photons and sending information back into your brain. And that's what's going on here. You're just replacing the organ that's picking that up. Okay. So in my lab, some years ago, we set out to accomplish sensory substitution for people who are deaf. So the idea is make some technology so that a deaf person can understand what is being said. And so um, some of you may have seen this TED talk I gave. In my lab, we built a vest with vibratory motors on the vest, and um, they're mapped from high to low frequency. So as sound comes in, you're feeling the sound on your skin. So here's what it looks like. So as I'm speaking, the sound is getting translated into dynamic patterns of vibration. I'm feeling the sonic world around me. And so here's what this looks like. If you look at the woman on the left saying, she's saying the word sound and then on the right, she's saying the word touch. You can see the way the motors are mapped out. You, I, I don't know if it's, it's easy for me to see this. I don't know if it's easy, but you know, you sound and then touch and on, on her shoulders, notice the high frequency stuff. Anyway, so the point is whatever is happening, you're feeling it on your skin. So we um, started experiments on this probably eight, nine years ago now. Uh, this was one of our first participants um, who was born profoundly deaf. And so we had him wear the vest for a couple hours a day for four days and here he's on his fifth day. This is my graduate student, Scott, sitting on the right, Jonathan, who's profoundly deaf is on the left. So Scott's going to say a word and Jonathan feels the pattern of vibrations on the vest and writes down what he, what he thinks he's come to understand. Where? Where? So he's feeling this complicated pattern on his skin and he's translating this into an understanding of what's, what's being said. Touch. Touch. Now, interestingly, he's not doing this. It's not, conscious exactly in the same way that when i'm speaking to you you're not thinking oh yeah eagleman saying some medium frequencies and then some high and some low and what like you just you just feel like you hear my voice 
Um, and, and by the way, you feel like you hear my voice on the outside, even though, of course, it's happening inside your head. Anyway, if you've ever seen somebody, let's say a blind person reading a book uh, with Braille, they're not thinking, okay, let's see, there's a bump there, a bump there. You know, instead, it's just they're, they're laughing, they're crying. It's, the meaning comes directly off the page. Exactly in the same way when you read a book and uh, you, know, you see these arbitrary squiggles on the page, um, you're just translating this directly into perceptual meaning. And that's what's going on with Johnson here. Um, this is a, a, a deaf uh, participant who we had come to our lab a little while ago and National Geographic was there to film this, but it wasn't because of him. It was because of his daughter who was born deaf and blind and we built a miniature vest for her. Um, and what you can see on the phone, it's all the sound waves, you know, as I'm speaking and so on. And, uh, and so she's feeling what's going on in the world around her. And here her grandmother is taking her around and, you know, like putting her feet on things and saying, this is soft, this is hard, this is cold, so on. And on the right side, she's on a bed that's going up and down. And the grandmother's saying up, 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 down, down, down. And, you know, this is how you learn is by making correlations across the, uh, the senses there. Um, we then shrunk this down to a chest strap for deaf children and, um, you know, uh, put this on a, a bunch of deaf children. But what we did then in the, in the intern uh, is we, um, we then shrunk the whole thing down to the size of a wristband. And the wristband has four vibratory motors on it, uh, each of which can have 256 levels of amplitude. And, um, and this has been, as, as a matter of product market fit, this is... Um, Turns out we discovered that nobody wants to actually wear a vest. And so um, this has been great for us. We put out this wristband. So here's, here's our very first participant. We're using a, an older prototype, but just to give you a quick sense of, of what it's like for a person who is deaf to be able to pick up on sounds in the world. Okay, so um, we've published lots of science on this. I'll just give a general statement on this without going into the details, but you know, so people learn essentially linearly through time. So on day one, we'll give them tests. They'll actually do better than chance on day one, which is interesting because some sounds are really intuitive, like somebody knocking on the door or a dog barking or a, uh, or a I don't know, um, you know, uh, somebody speaking or what, like there's certain sounds you can just, you feel them and you're like, oh yeah, I kind of got that. I know what that is. So people do better in chance and then they just get better and better. And the general story is we find, you know, by like week one or something, people can say, people say, I can tell the difference between my children talking. And by week two, they're like, I can tell the difference between my dogs uh, doing stuff. By week three, they're, you know, they just picked up on all these tons of things that they didn't even know they didn't know. Actually, here's an example. This is a word cloud that we put together eventually from all these users sending in things, just saying, wow, I, I had no idea that a microwave beeped or that, you know, um, whatever, or that my blinker made sounds in my car or whatever. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Micah asks, do deaf people learn how to speak more clearly by getting feedback about their own voice? That's exactly right. It's exactly what happens because you guys maybe know, um, if you've ever listened to a deaf person, deaf people speak like this. Have, have you ever heard a deaf person speak? Okay, so the question is, why does a deaf person speak like this? Does anybody know? Somebody tell me. The reason a deaf person speaks like this is because they can impersonate your mouth to make sounds, but they can't see what your tongue is doing. So if you just leave your tongue doing nothing, that's, that's how you sound. So there's nothing wrong with the articulatory mechanisms of a deaf person. It's just that they don't know where they're supposed to move their tongue where they're saying various things. So the key is now they can hear you say the quick brown fox and they can hear themselves say the quick brown fox and they can hear the difference there between what you're saying and what they're doing. And so they can learn how to use their tongue. So thank you for that question, Micah. That's exactly correct. Okay. So part of the reason this is, I think, very cool and a big deal is because the only option for people who are deaf is a cochlear implant, which is 100,000 bucks in invasive surgery, and our things is over 100 times less expensive than that. So this opens up to you know, even the poorest countries in the world. And one of the things that we're doing now is we have philanthropists 
who are donating money to put this in deaf schools all, all over the world. Um, <clears throat> so um, that was the very first thing we did was for deafness. But what we realized along the way is a very weird thing that wasn't our idea, it came from some other labs, which is that if you, if you make sounds and have tactile stimulation at the same time, that actually helps with ringing in the ears or tinnitus. And so the idea is, um, you know, we're playing sounds from the app and the, the wristband is hearing boop, 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 boop. And, and you feel these, um, you know, touches on your skin and it's super useful for driving down tinnitus. And the reason essentially has to do with um, you're teaching the brain the difference between external sounds, which get verification on the wristband and the internal beep, which doesn't get any confirmation on the wristband. And your brain comes to realize, oh, that's not a real sound from the external world. And so it drives it down. So that's been a, a very cool thing that we didn't expect, but that's just uh, something that came out of it. And then the thing that I'm super excited about is what we released just two weeks ago. So what we're doing with the Clarify wristband, this is for age-related hearing loss. What happens is people get older is they lose the ability to hear high frequencies because their cochlea actually gets you know, damaged. The little cells inside the cochlea die with age because high frequencies are the most high energy. Okay, so what we're doing is we developed real-time uh, machine learning to listen for the high-frequency parts of speech, high-frequency phonemes, in real-time without a delay, and to say, oh, I just heard an S. Oh, I just heard an F, a B, a V, a D. And we've got these different things. Okay. So the idea is your ear is doing all the work at the low and medium frequencies, but your wristband is clarifying what is happening at the high frequencies, so you can understand what is going on there. Um, oh, I guess I don't have another slide on it. But um, this is uh, this has been terrific. I, I thought I had it. Um, so we have some videos with with um, our participants, our user testimonials on this, about what this meant to them. Essentially, you, know, you put it on the first day, you don't really get what's going on, but it doesn't matter. All you need is exposure to speech. You listen to a podcast, you have a conversation with a friend and whatever, and it's just capturing the phonemes. And so after about three weeks, people describe it as a, as a pair of eyeglasses for their wrist. It's just absolutely crystal clear what's going on. The way that some people notice this is when they forget to wear their wristband and then people yell at them, their boss, their wife, whatever, yells at them and says, hey, why aren't you wearing the wristband? You can't understand what I'm saying today. And so people have had very uh, incredible experiences with this. So now, so we just launched this. I just posted on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago as, as part of a soft launch. And it's just been an unbelievable amount of take up. Um, I see Randall has a question. How do you choose the spatial temporal representations, the conversion from sound tactile? Great. Okay. Yeah. Terrific question. Are there specific translations that are more useful and learnable than others? So Randall, actually, let me come back to that question in a minute, because I, I want to tell about some of the other projects that we're doing. And, and your question is exactly right, which is that for the different projects, we want totally different translations. I'll just tell you what we do for the buzz, which is the one for deafness. We're just doing exactly what the cochlea does. We break up sound from high to low frequency. And then on top of that, we do all kinds of noise cancellation stuff. So it's actually, um, you know, uh, it's actually better than the cochlea in that sense. But fundamentally, it's just high to low Fourier transform. Um, for clarify, you know, we're just cap we have unique vibrations that say, oh, that was a B, a V, a T, and so on. Um, but for some of the others, we do very different things. I'll tell you about that. So one example is we're doing we're running uh, experiments at Stanford right now about balance. It turns out a, a really large percentage of the population, like fifteen percent of the population, mostly older people have real problems with balance. Their vestibular system starts getting worse with time and they don't know when they're tilting one way or another. And then what ends up happening is they'll fall down and they'll break a hip. So we built a collar clip with a nine axis uh, motion detector in it. And when somebody tilts, it speaks via Bluetooth to the wristband. So you can tell that you're tilting and which direction and how much. So you and so it allows you to say, even though your vestibular system is not picking up on it, your wrist is picking up on it now, and you can straighten out. Okay. Um, we've also done this with prosthetics where, uh, you know, when you get a prosthetic leg, it's hard to learn how to walk with it because you're not feeling anything from it. So you have to look at it all the time. So we put pressure and angle sensors in, and, and people can learn very rapidly how to walk with a prosthetic leg because they're getting the feedback 
from it. So they know, oh, okay, this is exactly where it's located and what pressures on it and so on. Okay. But beyond clinical applications, one of the things we've been very interested in is, you know, can we do other things like feed real-time streams of data from the internet? Um, this is one example of doing that where this participant is feeling real-time data and then two buttons will appear on his screen and he has to make a choice, choose one button or the other, and then he gets feedback a uh, second and a half later. And what he doesn't know is that we're actually feeding a real-time stream of data from the stock market and he's making real-time buy and sell decisions. And what we're and then he gets feedback on these. And what we're seeing is whether he can develop a, um, a, a, a perception of the economic movements of the planet, whether he can actually start feeling, uh, you know, tapping into what the stock market feels like. Um, we've done things with Twitter where, you know, we can scrape for any hashtag in real time and put thousands or, you know, uh, thousands of tweets, we can press them through automated sentiment analysis. So we know whether people are saying positive, negative, or neutral, and you can feel what's going on at any moment in real time, which is interesting because, you know, you can imagine a politician giving a speech, live televised speech and feeling in real time, how the nation is reacting to that, that sort of thing. Um, we are working on ways of, you know, replacing drug dogs with, um, you know, artificial molecular detectors so that a person can feel smells that they can't normally smell. Um, robotic surgery, surgeons have to spend some amount of their time looking at the monitors and, and doing things that way. But it would be terrific if they didn't have to, but instead could feel the state of the patient and know all of what's going on with the patient without having to stare at a monitor. Um, we've done this with drone pilots where we're feeding in the pitch, yaw, roll, orientation, and heading of a drone. So they know where the drone is and they can learn how to fly it in the fog or in the dark because um, essentially they're extending their skin up there far away and becoming one with the drone. Um, you know, when you look around, you can see so many places this would be useful for because just because of the fact that, you know, our modern world has gotten very complex and our visual systems are such that we have to serially look at each thing to understand what's going on there. But with touch, you can actually understand things multidimensionally. And that's because, you know, just imagine balancing on one foot, your brain is receiving lots of information from lots of different muscle groups, but it's used to doing that with um, with uh, proprioception and touch and so on. So you can actually, in some cases, do more with touch than you can with vision. Um, one of the things that I've been very interested in is reducing friendly fire by having soldiers be able to feel the location of their friendlies, um, even in the, you know, in the darker zone, you know, like Steve's on the other side of that boulder and Tom's behind you and Fred, you didn't expect to come out over there, but you, you feel, you know where they are. You can feel them at all times exactly where everyone is around you. So this is something I'm working on now to reduce or eliminate friendly fire. Um, but also, uh, I'm a scientific advisor for the television show Westworld. And so I put the vest in that. So um, uh, I now call it Vestworld. But the um, uh, I don't know if any of you saw season two, episode seven, but this is our vest in there. So that's you can see a picture of the vest on the screen here. But the, look at the guy in the middle. You can see the lights on the vest. That's what he's doing is he's feeling where the where the hosts are, the bad robots, and, and he is, you know, uh, using it to feel their location in time. Um, uh, here was another scene where, you know, some, some of the military contracts, uh, they suddenly feel this. They weren't expecting anything there, and they turn around and they get killed. So just goes to show if, um, you know, if... Uh, <clears throat> if AI goes bad, my vest won't help you. But anyway, uh, I'll just say one more thing. And then I see there's a couple of questions. So let me just uh, mention one more thing on this really quickly, which is we've used exactly the same idea with blind people. So here um, we're using LIDAR, which knows the location of all the people in the room. So this gentleman can feel where people are around him. And on top of that, we've added navigation. So he's never been here. And so we put, you know, a signal, okay, go straight, go left, go to the right, and so on. This happens to be a complicated one because we're trying to get him to a conference room that's at 45 degrees, but, um, you know, he is able to find it, he finds it perfectly just based on the navigation there. Okay, so, so that's what we're doing with feeling spatial sense. Okay, so, sorry, I saw a hand up before. Uh, 
yeah that was me um it was relative to 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 those spatial representations with westworld um so with the wet senses the biological senses um there is a an element that controls um the oversaturation and that's attention you you have a spotlight of attention and you move it around and and it's important for for the overall function of the senses so when you're here with the cyber sense uh, that combines together with the biosense is there an interaction with the attention mechanism some perturbation some difficulty or i'll tell you is it going through this loop? it's a great question um um, but the answer is this is what the brain is really good at doing is allocating attention to things that need to be attended. So for example, the feel of your shoe on your left foot right now, your brain is sending those signals, but presumably you're not paying attention to it, but you can, you can pay attention if you want. But if you get a rock in your shoe, then you'll suddenly pay attention to those signals because if they're doing what you expect, then you don't care. But the interesting part is that adding new senses it doesn't matter to the brain. It says, okay, good. I'll pay attention if there's something relevant there. And otherwise I'll just take it as background. Um, but here's the interesting part. You might think, one might think that if you add a new sense, that it's going to be overwhelming in some way. But if you have any friends who are, for example, born blind, they, if you try to tell them all about vision and explain it, they'll say, I don't understand. Like, what do you mean you're getting photons from, you know, half a mile away and you're seeing things that are, like that must be overwhelming. It must be really stressful for you. And, and you think actually, no, vision's kind of boring. I just, you know, I look what I want to look and whatever. It's exactly the same thing when you add new senses on, which is that it's not overwhelming. It's just, um, yeah, just something. Well, my question is different. So, uh, uh, the party problem, um, when you have the two, microphones that are the normal ones you can be at the party and listen to two people and associate their voices when you have the wristband the wristband is not differentiating who is giving the th and the d and, and other sounds so is there some overlapping that makes you actually worse at solving the party problem if you have you know inputs that are converging which are not necessarily the relevant ones um I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so let me uh, let me just. So, are you talking about for a deaf person or a person who's hearing and wearing the wristband? You well, it for some one of, one of the examples that you were giving was um, with the band vibrating differently, where you have the diphthongs and and the s and the g sound and etc. And imagine you're at the party and there's five people that are speaking. So the t is yeah. the g. Yeah. Okay, the... so let me let me just answer this question, which is your ear picks up on all the conversation in the room. So when you're at a cocktail party. You're hearing everybody, but what you're good at doing is scissioning, is attending just to the person that you're talking to, given their mouth movements and so on. It's exactly the same with this. This is just like, this is picking up precisely where your ear is picking up at. And by the way, if it makes it easier, just consider a person with, you know, unilateral deafness. A lot of people have lost hearing in one ear, but they're perfectly fine at a cocktail party. They can understand everything going on. The, I think the question you're asking is, hey, what if multiple people are speaking? That's exactly what you're always dealing with, but we're quite good at attending and just paying attention. It's, it's precisely the same thing here. So you're registering whatever sounds are going on on the wrist that you are with the ear, but you are able to pay attention to the conversation that you're having because of mouth movements on. There's no difference. Okay, good. I hope that answered your question. So please dig in more if you want to. Um, let me answer a question in chat. Uh, Micah asks, do you have any idea what the bandwidth of touch is relative to sight sounds? Well, yeah, so we've done a lot of experiments and published on this about the bandwidth. Um, the answer is you, uh, with touch, it's generally lower, but you can get a surprising number of bits per second through touch that way. But it totally depends on what you're trying to do. So sight, of course, has way higher bandwidth than anything else you've got you know we're extremely visual creatures we've got a third of our brain devoted to vision and you know a million neurons from each eye coming back so um vision's really high res but for example for the blind gentleman that i've got a picture of here you know what we're doing is we're telling him hey there's somebody there and the person is getting closer and farther and whatever this is pretty low bandwidth but it's super useful and by the way 
when people come and they're going behind him and around his back, he can feel it the whole way, which is actually better than a sighted person can do. So it, it's a trade-off of different things that you can pass through. The other thing about sight and hearing is that our, our vision and our ears are essentially completely overtaxed in modern life. So people obviously are building AR and contact lenses and things like that, where you can get more information and layers of information, but it's super overtaxed. And my feeling has always been that the skin is this incredible material that's just not used um, and has a very high bandwidth for passing information. And so it's appropriate for some kinds of information um, uh, more than others. So for example, you know, this thing about spatial location, like in Westworld or blindness or soldiers, is a terrific application of it. Passing in data streams that you just want to perceive in the background is a terrific application of it. If you wanted to actually translate the details to vision to touch, not such a good application because of the bandwidth problem. So thank you for that question, Mike. Hey, Dr. Um, I, I, had a, I had a quick question too. Um, I imagine you interact with neurosurgeons a fair amount. Uh, and I can tell, I think that your interest isn't necessarily in applying this tech to existing clinical applications, but the more interesting and exciting, like extra sensory type integration. But have you thought about closed loop deep brain simulation integration uh, and or like motor mapping as part of the implantation procedure? Yeah. Do you mean the mapping for the surgeon to wear this or do you mean for the patient to have some sort of closed loop thing going on? Uh, both. Uh, so closed okay. loop. Yeah, post operation as a way for them to know whether they're getting stimulated or not, and as yeah. a sort of biofeedback control, and then also for the surgery, it's a pretty convoluted process for how they do it now. But I imagine a, a surgeon might be interested, or an electrophysiologist, in your vest design for streaming in the neural data because then they could visually look at the movements being performed and feel the really dense, chaotic neural data. And I think that that might be like a pretty cool fit where neurosurgeons themselves, I imagine, would be pretty interested in using this type of tech and it kind of, you know, it's all neural focused. Yeah, exactly. So, so let me say a few points to that. One is that, <clears throat> so that just as, an, as that example, that would be a very niche market. And so what we're trying to do is hit really big markets and stay focused on that. So what we've done is we made an open API and SDK is for every platform so that people can build their own things. We have 70 different, plat um, 70 different projects like, like the one you're describing, not that one in particular, but um, if you're interested, go to neosensory.com slash developers. And what you can see are blog posts on all these cool, super neat different projects that we've got going on by our developer community. So that would be an example of the type of thing that I'm going to there because it's a pretty niche market, but a very cool, a very cool application. Excellent. More, more generally, in answer to your question, we have done lots of things, not, not that one you described, but things about closing loops. So, you know, people using EEG and being able to feel what's going on, you know, we do it different ways. Like, oh, here's my alpha band and beta and gamma and that, whatever. You can feel that as you're going so that things that are normally invisible to you because you become consciously aware of, of what your state is. But those are examples of closed loop things that would. Yeah, thanks. I, I recently sat in on a, uh, an OCD patient who was treated with experimental DBS. And mm -hmm. like one of, the, one of the questions that always comes up is like, okay, what is the stimulator doing right now? Like is, and with a lot of these like streaming devices now, you can actually record local field potential in addition to stimulating for significant periods of time. So like if you if you have OCD and we think that there is a biophysical signature of when compulsions arise, therapeutically, if the patient knows when those signals are present, they can then deploy cognitive behavioral therapy or some other sort of adjunctive treatment. Um, and like that type of pairing between context and therapeutic delivery in terms of like behavioral interventions is, not present right now. And like, that's that, that would cool. just be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's super cool. Yeah. Listen, if you, I mean, get in touch, if you want to work on that, it's super totally. easy. I mean, we, we set up the SDK, so it's super easy to yeah. take whatever data is coming from the device and just feed it right in. So you feel it. Cool. Very exciting. Yeah. Thank you for right. the question. Great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Anoush, you got your hand up. Yeah. So I got a question about like, what is the, physical limit to how many vibratory like modules or like 
So there's an array, right? On the vest, you have like an array of like vibratory um, sensors. What is, is there like a point of like diminishing returns? So it's how many that, that you could have. And like that comes into like the realm of like, hypothetically, could you just model as complex systems as you want? And like, would the number of um, vibratory sensors in the array affect the learning times and like how easy it is to learn complex systems? Yeah, great question. I don't think it would affect the learning time, but certainly it affects resolution. So for example, we built this, the vest he's wearing has 32 motors on it. We also built versions with 64 and 128 motors on it. What we found for the applications we were doing was sort of diminishing returns. But in theory, you could build a whole suit with super dense resolution. You just have to worry about what the resolution of different parts of the body, um, what those are. There's some called two-point discrimination, which is to say, at some point, if two points are close enough, you can't tell the difference. So there's no point in putting the motors closer than that. And different parts in the body have different two-point discrimination thresholds. So anyway, but you could cover the body in tons and tons of motors and presumably, I don't think it would change the learning time, but it would change the resolution of what you could accomplish. For example, I was just mentioning about vision. Like if I want to navigate this environment, there's a lot of stuff around here and I would need much higher resolution. So maybe you could do that. Yeah, it always depends on what the, uh, yeah, what you want to do. By the way, uh, Randall just put this note in about the fingers are better than your hip at, at resolution. So you've got like really good resolution on your, you know, uh, fingertips and on your lips and stuff like that, but less so on your wrist or on your torso. Um, just as a side note, for anyone who, you know, people here probably have different things going on. Some are in academia, some are in the entrepreneurial world. But I can tell you from the entrepreneurial perspective, um, everything's about product market fit. And so I probably get asked once a week, hey, why don't you build something that like goes on the face and you got higher resolution on the face or gloves? And the answer is nobody wants that, um, especially people with, you know, for example, hearing problems. What they want more than anything is for nobody to see this. And part of the reason we've had such early success with this is because people don't want hearing aids because it's socially embarrassing to them to have to wear that around. And so the idea that people would want shit on their face or wear gloves around or something is, is totally mismatched. We've done a ton of product market research on this. So I just, I only wanted to, I only wanted to mention, yeah, Google Glass is a good example, Randall, of, you know, this thing of having a camera and it seemed like a great idea. Nobody wanted that sort of thing. Yeah, but I hear it's coming back. So uh, for yeah. industrial reasons, but not for consumer reasons. Uh, no, no consumers are going to walk around with a camera on like that. But if we've if we've reached kind of the Q and A period, then I'm going to I'm going to take the risk and dive right in and ask you something that's maybe going right. to take us in a slightly different direction. I'm personally yeah, really really interested in this. So we all know for, that for, um, for what it's worth. For what it's worth, I still had a few more slides, but I don't. I can go either way. I, do you want uh, Do you want to present them first? Yeah. It depends if you, if your thing is going to take us in a different direction. Maybe I'll just do this real Go ahead. Fast. Yeah, do that. Okay, first. great. Uh, I'll do this real fast and then we'll. So, oh, I was just going to say we have a different way of doing for blindness. We have a little um, uh, echo locator that does sonic sounds and, and blind people can uh, feel the world around that. We're doing a lot of stuff in AR, VR, where you're wearing two wristbands and you're feeling the location of virtual objects. So you can grab them much more effectively and know the depth of them. So, but you can also do things outside your visual field, like, oh, I'm feeling there's an object behind me, stuff like that. We've done a lot of stuff with, you know, uh, the vest where you're feeling, you know, let's say in this game, people are shooting at you from different directions. And so you can know exactly where to go and how to, how to deal with this. Um, the, uh, we've also done this with essentially, it's like Ready Player One, where you can touch other people in VR. So people are actually you know, touching each other, they can feel what's going on there. So these are all things that we've done here. Um, I'm real interested in factories, being able to understand very high dimensional systems, like how is the factory running? And I'm not talking about just doing alerts. I'm talking about feeling like, oh, these machines are running faster and these are running slower and something's happening here. Being able to feel the operation of high dimensional systems. So I just let me wrap up by saying, you know, I think there's no limits on the horizon, the kind of things we can do. And, and the question is, you know, how do you want to, experience your universe. So that's, uh, so that's all what I'll say. Okay. Now, Randall, let's go to your question. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be a hugely long one. It's just that, um, anytime when I'm thinking about, uh, you know, se sensory substitution, I think back to just experiences that we already have, like, for example, 
uh, you know, if you're a good driver, you kind of sense the extent of your car and you sort of know where it is. So it's sort of as if it becomes a part of your body in a way. And if your kayak or the kayak feels like your body completely, like, you know, you kind of know when you're about to touch a rock or something like that, that's kind of like when you're just balancing on your legs and things like that. Um, and so that then leads to, you know, thoughts about how we not only construct the world around us as a model, but we construct the model of ourselves. Uh, we have a, you know, a self model and, and how much that becomes a part of our identity. So you're kind of crossing over from just, you know, the purely sort of psychological neuroscience thing about self models to this more philosophical thing about personal identities and whether identities are a real thing or construct in what sense and so forth. So I was really interested to know with the plethora of work that you've done so far in this area, what has this taught you about yeah. that? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So thank you for that excellent question. Um, so in my, in my last book, Livewire, uh, I wrote at length about this issue of how we determine what the self is because you're made of trillions of cells. And yet, you know, if I'm walking, uh, you know, in my living room, I can go to the left or the right around that chair, but I can't do both. So you've got this, you know, the brain's often celebrated for its parallel processing, but equally as amazing to me is the serialization, the fact that it says, okay, I've got all these options. I'm going to do this one thing because I've got one body. And so you've got this notion of the self, but what I wrote about in Livewired is how it, um, how it comes to determine what that is. And my assertion is that it's all about what it can control. So it's putting out signals and seeing what it can control. And if you can control, then it becomes part of the self, which is why your car or your kayak becomes part of the self in that moment. Or when you look at your mirror reflection, you know, I, I put out signals, I see it, I'm like, okay, cool, that's part of myself. And what happens is you get all these, you know, strange clinical cases where someone gets a severed nerve and they have their leg there, but they can't control it anymore. And they say, what's this leg in my bed? That's not mine. Somebody must have put it there. There's all these, um, you know, strange um, asymptomatic notions that people get with this sort of thing. This is interesting. This can take me in a lot of different directions because saying what you control becomes a part of yourself. And then you can, you can either go internally and think things like uh, your recollection things you can pull back out of memory is something you can control to a degree. So that is a part of you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're El Presidente, dictator for life, then of course the entire nation is a part of you because you control what everybody else does. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. I think control is slightly different. Well, that's right, that's, that's a good <laughs> metaphorical extension, but you know, control like, you know, you've got this three pound, you know, mission control center here and it's sending out signals and it sees what comes back. And if I can a hundred percent make something control then it's then in itself but something like a spouse you know you don't you certainly don't have 100 percent control over a spouse but it's it's like it's close to you but it's not quite you wouldn't call it part of yourself you wouldn't get confused in that way even though so anyway that's why the el president they might not yeah 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 but yeah. boundaries are so vague right because do you ever have total control over your your own body things like that i mean i think so especially if you're an athlete and you're doing the thing you know you're a great gymnast or whatever like you can really um, yeah, anyway, yes, I, I think generally when it comes to, hey, is that mirror image me? Yep. Oh, I mean, yeah, I, th th this leads to odd questions then about people who, for instance, have uh, seizures and suddenly lose control over themselves and how that affects their sense of self. Oh, you're not, that's a cool question. Yeah. Like or who become paraplegic and so forth. Yeah. So I'll tell you one thing we're doing uh, that I didn't have in the slide deck, but, you know, doing things with avatar robotics. So there's this whole world that's growing now about people controlling avatars to let's say take care of an emergency site where there's been a chemical spill or radiation or whatever, you can control a robot to go in there. So what we're doing is hooking up the robot with sensors so that the, the operator can feel what the robot is feeling if there's heat or something falls on the robot or whatever. Um, and I think this is gonna close the loop in a way that's gonna really make this um, a, a tight sense of self, just like with the drone pilot, you know, you can see where the drone is, but when you're feeling the drone, it much more makes the drone a part of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot to think about here. Cool. Yeah. So what other, I want to make sure I get a chance to answer anybody's question if anyone's got, oh, uh, Micah asks, have you investigated, uh, is there anyone connecting directly to the brain rather than going through the skin? Yeah, so essentially there's non-invasive brain machine interfaces, which is what I do. And then there's the invasive world, for example, Neuralink, which is, 
you know, you drill a hole in the skull and you stick electrodes. And of course, of course, what Neuralink is doing is quite sophisticated, but that, that sort of thing has been happening since the 1960s where you insert electrodes into the brain. It's just that those have been sort of bigger and bulkier and they're getting smaller and smaller. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the invasive side of the world where you connect directly to neurons and you can do any of the same stuff. As a personal choice, I'm putting all my chips on the non-invasive because this is, you know, for less than $1,000, you can get all kinds of stuff and you strap it on and take it off when you want. Going in for an open head surgery is a, different, a totally different kind of uh, uh, proposition. Um, okay, uh, Mariana writes, my internet is great. Uh, do you know about any experiments of sensory augmentation in depression or dementia? You know, that's such a cool question. Um, I don't. I actually don't know anybody doing it in either of those two cases. Part of the challenge, even with a very simple wristband like this, is getting somebody to put it on and do the thing. And so we're all into it. We're like, yeah, I want to do the stock market or whatever. But if somebody is depressed or has dementia, it's very difficult to even think of how to get it on them. Um, you know, and make sure that they wear it every day. But in any case, it's a cool question, and I'll keep thinking on that. But so far, I don't have anything. Yeah, so for that, maybe you do, would do an implant if, if you had the, uh, if you had some particular clinical program that you thought was very useful to you. Yeah, yeah your insights on uh, patient compliance and patient concern over having something visible that is a therapy, I think are, are really spot on from my own experience. Yeah. And like, there, it's so easy to underestimate how big a deal it is. It's so, so hard to get people to do the simplest things when it improves your quality of life so drastically. Like maybe that's part of some self-defense mechanism where people are like, ah, I don't really have a problem. I don't really need that thing. But it, it's super, super, super important to think about. And I, I had a related question to the dementia point. Um, I wonder if like putting this on patients who are in comas uh, gives them, an, and like people say that when you talk to patients under comas, it provokes some neural activity and there's some back and forth there. I wonder if this would kind of just be like an extra set of ears potentially where there's just another parallel information stream to the conventional auditory input that they feel on their arms when someone's talking to them or when there's music in the room. Um, I don't know. That seems like a low cost, high reward type type of study. And it's true, potentially. Um, having them you know, feed in other auditory information might be the only weird part of that is that they'd have to learn how to interpret that. A slightly easier version might be that we can use this to give like little strokes or touches. So you could say to the person under the assumption that the person can hear you and understand you like, hey, every once in a while, I'm just going to send you a little stroke. And that's just me thinking about you. And then, of course, you could set it up in an automated fashion so that once in every hour with some randomization, you know, and they're getting a stroke from you. They know that it's you thinking about them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Allison. Yeah. Well, I always have the final question of what's the number one challenge that you'd like to see solved that a new person entering the field could take on. Like if someone now got super inspired and was like, I want to contribute, like where, where are you? Like, this is a bottleneck where people can really make a difference. Uh, I think for neuroscience in general, it's just a measurement problem, which is to say, even with our fanciest technologies like fMRI, it's very crude technology. And, um, and so we have really very little chance of breaking the neural code unless we just guess it right, which we have not done yet, because you've got 86 billion neurons chattering between tens and hundreds of times a second. And, um, and they're organized in a very complicated manner. And so what we need is a way to actually image this in real time, ideally, and look at the signals from all 86 billion. And even companies like Neuralink or any of the ones like it are just measuring from a few hundred or a thousand neurons. And so we, we really need a completely different scale of being able to measure what's happening in the brain. And then we'll have a chance of cracking that code. And finally, uh, this is like a shameless plug moment. Like what could people do to support like your individual work? Oh, um, you know, I would say go to neosensory.com slash developers and take on a project, take whatever you've always wanted to do and, uh, you know, make a project out of it. Super, super simple. We've made it so that you can just send Bluetooth frames to the wristband. And, and uh, all you have to do is think about what information source you want to perceive and how to best translate that um, into, into feeling all the risk.
I'm super tempted because I have so many self-improvement projects that this would be useful for in one way or another. Yeah. Right. Uh, tempting. Okay. Oh, I see so Lennon, I have... Lennon has a question. Yes, this is a bit tangential, but I'm quite curious. I hope the mic's picking me up okay. So, David, for an interview discussing free will for Reason TV, you spoke of a more informed sentencing based on neurological evidence. However, you also explicitly mentioned locking people up that were bad seeds. My question is this, do you stand by locking people up as a form of punishment? And if so, why? Oh, it has nothing to do with punishment. It has to do with brains are very different from one another. Some people, for a lot of people, there are good rehabilitative strategies that we can do. And for those people, we should get them rehabilitated and out of the system, but there's a whole spectrum. And some people, uh, for example, with psychopaths, there is no rehabilitative strategy that anyone has found yet that works. And so for that end of the spectrum, you have to lock them up, not as punishment, but to keep society safe. You definitely don't want to have Jeffrey Dahmer walking around because we're a bunch of liberals and we think it would be great to let everyone out. I am so sorry, but I have to go. I have to be on 11 o'clock yeah, meeting. We know. You've got another great, meeting. Thank you great, so much. Great to see all you guys. Take good care. It's been wonderful. Thank you.